Can you believe I'd actually planned to do video reviews of Doctor Who Series 9 in its entirety by this Christmas? Jesus H. Christ on a motorbike, what was I thinking? But you know what? This is one opportunity that I refuse to let slide. The Christmas special has been a tradition of Doctor Who for a full decade now, with the latest one, aka the first new episode we'll be getting for an entire year, right around the corner. Last year's special, The Husbands of River Song, I thought was actually quite good, but for a while there, it seemed like the Christmas special was doomed to be the one big bit of fluff. Occasionally fun, but feeling more and more like an obligation rather than a treat as time went on. With one exception. A Christmas Carol opens, like all good Christmas stories should, with thousands of people about to crash to their deaths. If there's one thing that writer Stephen Moffat is good at, even in some of his mediocre or downright bad episodes, it's a cold open that hooks you in, and this is no exception. The tone of the whole episode is set in just two short minutes, as the captain of the crashing ship tries in vain to regain control, and Amy and Rory pop into the room having been interrupted by the turbulence in a bit of roleplay, and eager to let everyone know that the doctor can fix things. The scene is tense enough that you buy the crashing of this ship as dilemma enough to base the episode around, even though we won't be seeing too much of it from here on out, but also importantly fun and funny enough to let you know that the rest of the episode is going to be mostly a romp. It's a bit sad that Amy and especially Rory don't have much to do in this story, especially since this was the first episode to feature Arthur Darvill's name in the opening, but I'm glad they at least get something to do unlike nearly every other Christmas special where the Doctor is without a regular companion. We cut to Michael Gambon as our Scrooge for this evening, a.k.a. Kazran Sardik, and even compared to most versions of Scrooge, this guy is a colossal tool. Where Scrooge is often just miserable, the amount of pleasure Sardik takes as he gleefully antagonizes a poor family and holds their relative in stasis from them has to be seen to be believed. I was one of those American plebs who'd only known Gambon as Dumbledore prior to this special, and never once does that character come to mind here. He's totally disappearing into the performance. Unfortunately, this massive tool is also the only one capable of helping land the crashing ship, which we learn with the arrival of the star himself. Ah! <laughs> yes! <clears throat> Blimey! Sorry, Christmas Eve on a rooftop, saw a chimney, my whole brain just went, what the hell? This has become something of a staple of Moffat-written episodes, always having an episode go on for a few minutes and building a mood before the Doctor can shatter it with a dynamic entrance of some kind. This is my favorite example of that happening, and I feel as though scenes like this... ...are often failed attempts to recapture the magic of this moment. The poor family is on their way out the door, despondent, when suddenly in comes this living embodiment of wit and whimsy down the chimney like Saint Nick himself. And for a few minutes, the entire atmosphere is light and breezy and he's got the attention of everyone in the room completely overriding Sardik's domineering cruelty. It's the perfect encapsulation of what his role in this story is going to be. Unfortunately, this only lasts so long before Sardik is provoked and almost smacks the young poor boy, before stopping at the last second and opting to simply throw them out. We then get a little bit of reading the room from the Doctor, which lets you know just how much Moffat wished he was writing Sherlock Holmes, before he would go on to write Sherlock Holmes. It's in the middle of this deduction that Sardik's implacable demeanor, already slipping, completely falls apart, and we get the sense that he's most definitely not happy being the way he is, not just through exposition, but through Gambon's stellar acting. I despise Christmas. Shouldn't. Very you. It's what? What do you mean? Halfway out of the dark. Once outside, the Doctor contacts Amy, and he starts formulating a plan to change Sardik's mind. And it's here where a couple of neat things happen. Firstly, we're introduced to the Flying Fish, one of those really simple but also really unique and Doctor Who-ish concepts that isn't really pivotal to the story's presentation, but helps differentiate the setting a lot. We also get some subtle foreshadowing to the Flying Shark that's going to play a big role later. But the biggest plus to this scene is the Doctor getting his idea on how to change Kazran's mind from listening to what else but a Christmas carol. It goes without saying that such a meta plot point wouldn't be found in direct adaptations of a Christmas carol, but even other movies or shows that only borrow the premise of a grump made to appreciate Christmas can feel a bit lazy in that regard. Don't get me wrong, I love straight adaptations of a Christmas carol in all shapes and sizes, but rarely do you see a character already aware of Charles Dickens' story trying to knowingly enforce it. 
Except, weirdly, an All Dogs Go to Heaven Christmas Carol. Because that exists. And not only is the Doctor showing Kazran his past, he's also changing it. This is probably the most unique retelling of the basic Christmas Carol story I've ever seen, if it can even really be called that. And while this is especially true of how the Ghosts of Christmas present and future are handled, I'll get to that later. For now, we have the Doctor playing Ghost of Christmas Past, his traveling to Kazran's childhood done in a really impressive shot, by the way. They're a bit more in the way of hijinks that solidified for me just how perfect the dynamic is between the Eleventh Doctor and children, we get to learn about young Kazran, namely that he's interested in the fish on account of never having seen one up close. Something that provides retroactive context for this line. It's all Mr. Sardis' fault, I reckon. He always lets a few fish through the cloud layer when he's in a bad mood. The Doctor sets up a way for he and young Kazran to see a fish, all while old Kazran watches all the proceedings on a recording. What kind of tie is that? A cool one. Why is it cool? When a fish finally arrives and Kazran is apprehensive, we also get what might be my favorite exchange in the episode. Trust me. Look at me. Oi, eyes on the tie. Look at me. I wear it and I don't care. Trust me. <laughs> yes. That's why it's cool. Stephen Moffat has a habit of taking recurring gags or motifs and paying them off in ways that are small in execution but big in impact. Here, the Eleventh Doctor's catchphrase of bow ties are cool is used to say something about the man more than just his quirky strangeness. For over 50 years, one of the Doctor's most consistent character traits has been unflinching self-confidence. And this instance of him exemplifying that confidence for a child who desperately needs some of his own instantly strengthens the relationship between these two characters. And then the shark shows up. And like the opening with the spaceship, the short scene of the Doctor and Kazran backed into a corner from the shark is both tense and hilarious, not only because of Matt Smith, but also the boy playing the young Kazran. Kazran is played by three different actors across the episode, and all three have such a natural chemistry with Smith that I really do buy this friendship even though he's a one-off character. I also just really like the way that this sequence is shot for some reason. The Doctor and Kazran stun the shark, but with half the sonic screwdriver in it, it becomes very ill. Kazran asks if they can save it, and I like the moment where the Doctor looks at the boy and is shocked silent at his sadness and empathy. It's a bit of a reversal of his role as Ghost of Christmas Past, since for a moment he has to be dragged back down to Earth and be reminded of another creature's suffering. All of it done by the Scrooge, who even in his bitter adult stage is weeping over the shark. The two go to find an ice box to keep the shark in until they can release it to the wild in better health, and I love this moment of the Doctor getting momentarily distracted by the Christmas tree. For some reason I can't articulate, the fact that his voice is so overwhelmed by the music really makes the moment. Kazran's father has a bad habit of taking people's family members and holding them in cryostasis until they pay off their debts, as was the case with the girl Kazran himself was hoarding from the poor family at the top of the episode. The shark acclimates to the cold quicker than expected, and after a short chase, who should be there to soothe the savage beast but that very same girl? Abigail's her name, and her cryo chamber is the one that they choose to carry the shark in, meaning she and Kazran get to be wowed by the TARDIS as they make the trip to release the beast. And can I just take a moment now to gush about the production on this episode? The direction, the cinematography, the CG, Murray Gold's score, it all contributes so much to making this episode stand out. And for lack of a better term, it really gives this thing that Christmas magic. That ethereal quality that makes me want to see it every December. And this is also funny. He comes every Christmas Eve. What? Yeah, he does. Every time, he promises. No, I don't... Merry, Merry Christmas! And then the Doctor, Kazran, and Abigail fly around on a one-shark open sleigh. This is the one scene that for some reason seems to break this episode for the people who don't like it, and being honest, I don't get it. Like, this was silly enough to undermine the episode for you? I always found it a really charming and inspired moment, surprisingly more so than when the Doctor would take a sleigh ride with the actual Santa Claus five years later. It's also a good example of characters just having downtime, which even in very economic scripts is something I think that character-driven stories should strive to find a place for, and something Doctor Who doesn't get to do very often. And so these romps become a yearly thing, with the trio going on trips every Christmas Eve, all the while creating new memories for the old Kazran. 
Soon young Kazran has grown into a teen, and of course he grows attracted to Abigail just as she decides to use this holiday to visit her family. The teenaged Kazran is, as I mentioned earlier, yet another example of great chemistry with a doctor. It's mentioned that he never seems to have any friends, and that, combined with his father's standoffishness, means that the doctor was, in all likelihood, his primary influence. I bring this up because it comes through in the performance. Kazran acts like someone who's taken all of his social cues from Eleven, except once again without any of the boundless confidence to offset the equally boundless awkwardness. If I wanted to do a metatextual reading, Kazran is almost like certain types of fans of the show. The type who get in at an early enough age that they start emulating the Doctor's affectations and dress sense as time goes on. And I don't think it's reading too much into the episode to make that comparison, seeing as Moffat's time as showrunner has basically consisted of one massive, ongoing six-year meta-commentary on the nature of the show and how fans perceive it. Kazran and Abigail's romance starts to blossom, but soon enough Abigail reveals to Kazran and not the Doctor that she's deathly ill and has only another day or two to live. The Doctor comes in and provides a moment that's hilarious, but also a tragic case of dramatic irony on a rewatch as he babbles on about getting hitched to Marilyn Monroe, while Kazran and Abigail solemnly smooch over her impending death. There aren't any cuts as he enters and exits the scene, and I think it's a microcosm of his role in these two people's lives up to this point. He's their comic relief, who shows up, makes a funny, and then leaves, ignorant to their trauma when it's the very thing that he's there to fix. It's telling that his very next line of dialogue is I'll see you in a minute, I, I mean, a year. As if to highlight how the nature of his visits as ephemeral yearly drive-bys that exist only as romps has distanced himself from Kazran and his issues. While still keeping the doctor in the dark, Kazran opts to abruptly cut their trips off so Abigail can survive, clearly blaming the doctor for this having happened. Keeping with the motif of Kazran as stand-in for the audience, I like that one of his excuses for not doing this anymore is that he's outgrown it. Well, Christmas is for kids, isn't it? Makes you wonder why the Doctor never considered visiting on Halloween, or Easter, or Groundhog Day. That works for making people less selfish. With his father providing one last push, Kazran almost takes the Doctor's offer to call him up, but seeing him having already arrived rejects him out of spite. Old Kazran turns out to have still become a douche nozzle, having taken the absolute wrong message from his altered past experiences. He still refuses to save the ship, and that's when the Ghost of Christmas Present arrives in the form of a kissogram. Hello! I'm the Ghost of Christmas Present. A ghost? Just like that? Eyes off the skirt. You turn into a Roman. As stated earlier, I love how much of a creative spin this is on the old story, with hologram projectors being used in place of magic to show Kazran the crashing ship. Kazran rejects Amy's pleas and explains to her Abigail's condition, as well as the fact that she only has one day to live. Now, originally, my one big problem with this episode was that Kazran hating the Doctor for his predicament felt a bit forced. His love was dying, sure, but he knows the Doctor intended none of it. However, listening to his dialogue on my most recent watch through, one line stuck out to me. She's used up her time on those Christmas Eves with me. Abigail didn't have much time left when the Doctor and Kazran found her, but she had time nonetheless. And in Kazran's mind, it was spending time with him that brought her closer to death. The Doctor didn't just unknowingly leave Kazran with the burden of choosing Abigail's final day to live, but with the knowledge that, for all intents and purposes, they were the cause of her death. Kazran is stuck in a loop of inactivity, unwilling to save the spaceship because he doesn't want the power over the mortality of anyone. He doesn't want that control. The control. 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 Nobody has to die. Everybody has to die. Not tonight. Tonight's as good as any other night. How do you choose? Kazran defaults to complete fatalism because the weight of Abigail's life and death is too much. Everyone has to die, everyone's going to die, and it's going to be horrible for everyone, so why not sooner rather than later? A child who used to model himself after the Doctor is now a bitter, cynical man who wants to be nothing like him, because caring in the face of death certainty is too hard. In trying to oppose this, the Doctor shows up as the Ghost of Christmas Future, and this... This is very clever. And show me the future. Prove me wrong. I am showing it to you. I'm showing it to you right now. So what do you think? You 
this who you want to become, Kazra? Dad? That young Kazran calls his older self Dad adds to the idea of this moment as the definitive turning point for his whole personal timeline. This thoroughly muddles exactly what has happened in the timeline of Kazran as he is at the end of the episode, but I think it's worth it. In apologizing to his child self, it's almost as if young Kazran is getting that tearful apology from his father, and more than the doctor, more than even Abigail, his father is the root of all Kazran's problems. Even as he intellectually knows his father isn't who he's dealing with, I think this moment of catharsis is what instantly shapes the decent person who we have at the end, and it doesn't invalidate the rest of the episode because it's only his memories of the Doctor and Abigail that allow this beat to happen. As if to prove me right, Child Kazran grew up into such a different person after this experience that his father neglected to give him access to the fog machine. No, I mean the machine that controls the fog. No, the machine that controls the clouds. That's the one. Desperate to save the day, Kazran pulls out the old half of the Doctor's screwdriver and one- Eureka! And a bout of technobabble later, the Doctor concludes that the only way to save the ship is to let Abigail out and have her sing. Finally, ready to face mortality, Kazran does so. We get a gorgeous song, the conspicuous absence of snow is remedied, the ship is saved, the TARDIS trio reunites, and the Doctor asserts that yes, Everything ends, but it's better to embrace the change so that something new can begin. We end in the knowledge that Kazran and Abigail only have one more day together, but that they plan to spend it halfway out of the dark. A Christmas Carol is far and away the best holiday special this show has pulled out in its 10 plus tries, and one of my favorite Stephen Moffat episodes, which is saying a lot. I make it a point to watch it with my family every Christmas day. The main reason I made this a scene-by-scene -scene linear review as opposed to a more general format is because there's just too much good to unpack in each moment. Despite being longer than the average episode, it's got a real brisk pace to it, and a tone that, fittingly enough, shifts between light and dark without either mood undermining the other. I've already praised all the acting, music, visual elements, etc., but those things wouldn't mean nearly as much if they weren't in service of such a thorough and well-done character study. This episode is the story of Kazran Sardik, and by that token, one of the best uses of the Doctor as Space Gandalf, so to speak. Like in The Girl Who Waited, the Doctor is here the supporting protagonist of the story. The one who pushes events forward, but not the one whose growth and opportunity for change the narrative ultimately hangs on. I think it's this aspect of he and Kazran's relationship that makes it one of the best one-off dynamics in the modern series. This episode also just feels like Christmas. That might be because the story of A Christmas Carol is so irrevocably linked to the holiday, certainly more so than a standard Alien of the Week plot with holiday trappings thrown on top. A Christmas Carol is also the only special so far that feels like it needed to take place on Christmas, and is adding to the themes of compassion, love for yourself as well as others, and a general joy for life in the face of death that made the original Dickens tale so great. I hope you'll forgive me for being so indulgent with this one. I really do have a passionate adoration for this episode, and I'd never forgive myself for not talking about it on Christmas now that I have the means. Plus, I needed to talk about something that I loved, since I have a bad feeling that the next few videos I make won't be nearly as positive. Subscribe if you haven't already to stay tuned for those, and I'll see you in the future. Have a merry, merry Christmas, all of you.